Now, it's going to be a delight to hear from Emeritus Professor Ngahuia Te Awi Kotuku. Um, Ngahuia has connections to uh, Te Arawa, uh, Tuhoi, Ngapui and Waikato. Uh, she's a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit, a companion of the Royal Society of New Zealand and a fellow of the Auckland War Memorial Museum. Uh, Ngahuia has written extensively on Māori history and uh, especially on issues of gender and sexuality in the early Māori world. Kia ora Ngahuia, welcome. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Kia ora Dave, thank you for that lovely introduction. And ngā mihi kauana ki a koutou, uh, ane he kōrero paku. I'm, um, I'm really excited about our conversations today and I regret that um, I can't be online or rather visible like the uh, speaker Alistair and the Irish weather. I live on a volcanic landscape and um, our internet connections here are very, very weak. And so Dave, the technician, very kindly suggested that um, I become a voice rather than a pixelated, blur, rather steam-infested image on screen. Anyway, I'm going to talk today about um, some of the work I've done on sexuality and gender, but I'd also like to say that actually I'm an art historian. I'm not um, a social scientist, and so much of the stuff I've done comes from the humanities, comes from sources like oral history, chant, and of course, carved images. Um, I'll talk about some of the traditional record and then I'll conclude with issues for us to think about. And I've begun with um, an image that was performed and presented during the campaign against HIV. And this is a group of young Māori men from um, the Auckland area. And I'm in context now. I'll just give you a very fast um, history lesson because I think this explains and contextualizes the world that I live in, which is very different from mainstream New Zealand. Um, one of the things that's special about our land is that unlike other indigenous societies and communities and populations, Māori live within islands with very defined borders. And we have over 40 distinct tribal groups, but we have one common language unlike the peoples of North America and the Aboriginal populations of Australia. Here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have one language which is Indigenous, the Māori language, and from the very far north right down to um, the bluff, we speak with the same tongue. Um, when we were initially in contact with Pākehā, after um, Cook arrived in 1769, Māori people welcomed literacy with huge excitement and also, of course, techie, which transformed our art, our faces, our world. Um, metal was hugely embraced and welcomed, but so was literacy and the ability to communicate across great distances with accuracy so that missionaries were actively invited into community primarily because they taught people how to read and how to write. And at one point, there were more literate Māori in the country than there were Pākehā. Pākehā being, um, to those overseas people listening, um, a word for um, British and European. In 1840, of course, the treaty was signed with Britain 
1842, it was when the last shots were fired here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, at Maunga Pohatu in 1916. At the time of the signing of the treaty in 1840, there were over 100 Māori and about 3,000 Pākehā. Most of those Pākehā were traders, missionaries, transients. Fifty years later, there were 600,000 Pākehā, less than 40,000 Māori. So that kind of contextualises where I come from. However, during that period, in 1867, um, government established four seats in the House for Māori representation. In the, 18, in the 1990s, that was um, on a population basis increased to seven Māori seats. At the election um, three weeks ago, or nearly a month ago now, um, all those seven Māori seats were taken by the fiercely pro-Māori Te Pāti Māori, which is, I think, a great victory for us, although we are in opposition. So when you think about what it means in my world, coming from that background, to be um, way we are, and at this point I'll say I'm, um, I'm lesbian, I'm whakawahine, um, one of the words that is constantly used is takatāpui, and something's happened with my screen, I'll have to go back. Māori enjoyed sexuality in many, many forms. Although there was, of course, an emphasis on continuing one's life and having children, people chose partners of either sex for pleasure. And same-sex love was not condemned. It was not vilified. Both male and female lovers feature prominently in the chant poems of their time. And relevant behaviours and even physical details were very fondly described. Um, one example is um, a rather magnificent um, long chant, and it describes the of a young man and his prowess um, having sex, not just with women, but with men as well. And what is interesting, um, there are a number of songs like this, is that in the late 19th century, a lot of the oral record was interfered with and barbarized um, by translation into English. At this point too, I think it's important to note that in the Māori language, in all the languages of the Pacific, we do not have sex pronouns. We do not have words for she and he and her and him. We have one pronoun, which is ear. And so, for example, in the translating of a lot of um, Māori mythic material, particularly with regard to deities, and um, beings of power, the translators being either missionary educated or missionary white men themselves ended up um, turning everything into male. Um, currently we are turning a lot of that information around so that when you have the Māori creation story of the Sky Father and the Earth Mother and all their sons, a lot of those individual deities were female. They were female. And yet, of course, in the iconography, in the image making, in the 20th century school journals, they are all boys. So that's a kind of um, issue that one encounters dealing with um, such a, a gendered language as English 
and the um, languages of Europe coming here to Aotearoa and to the Pacific, encountering um, communities in which he and him and she area do not exist. Um, related to this, I think, is as well the, um, the notion that any form of sexuality apart from the missionary position um, in the 19th century world was considered sinful. And one of the more comic and um, brilliant examples of this is in a lot of correspondence between individual missionaries, and um, as well as that, um, I found a number of personal journals and um, manuscripts, letters written by visiting white men who consorted with um, various colourful natives. And I think one of them is um, exemplified in Jane Campion's film The Piano, 1992, where we had a character named Tahu, played by Mika, and um, who flirted outrageously with um, most of the male characters in the film. Um, Tahu is very much that kind of um, personage whom I'll discuss later in the um, in the presentation. Um, on screen now is um, an um, excerpt from a letter about William Yates, who was dismissed from the CMS because he was discovered romping in the waves naked with a couple of young men. Um, these young men were also interviewed, of course, by the church um, officials. And to them, and one of them, I will say, went on to be um, a really talented scribe who assisted in the drafting of the Māori version of the Treaty of Waitangi, as well as the English version. Um, these young men were absolutely unaware that whatever they would could possibly fall. And I think coming into an indigenous world and um, a place like Aotearoa, like Hawaii, like Samoa, like Tahiti, like the Marquesas, um, and bringing, bringing that frozen northern hemisphere bigotry, we do see um, some interesting transformations occur. Continuing though, um, and I'm just conscious of time because I want to give you time to ask me questions, people wonder about the words for being like that. Um, as a young woman in a very traditional community, I was surrounded by people like that. As long as we didn't flaunt it, we were okay. If you flaunted it, then you had to move to a bigger city like Wellington or Auckland or um, Sydney. But being like that was in no way shameful or um, sinful. However, because of um, the legal context of the day, it was criminal. And of course, as we know, it was criminal until 1986 and the change in legislation. What were the words that were used for each other? Um, again, in the old record, there are words like whakawahine. And whakawahine, is um, exactly the same as the Samoan Fafafine and the Tongan Fakaleiti. It is not about being exactly the opposite sex. It is about behaving in the manner of and assuming the style of the opposite sex. 
For example, we have a town here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, called Whakatā. The town was, ma- was given that name by the heroic action of a young female who dragged a canoe from the tide and brought it safely onto the beach. And in hauling the canoe up onto the shore, she said to the gods and to whoever was around her, Kia whakatāne, o iaho, let me make myself like a man. So whakatā is our way of saying, let me make myself like a man, but it does not mean that I want to physically change my body to become one. And um, here we get into the conversations and the issues around um, transitioning and medical intervention and um, taking on the characteristics, the genitalia, the whatever of the other. Um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll leave that to my final slide. I have um, particular concerns about the way that currently such choices are so glamorized and so um, exhilarated that many of our young ones think that's the best choice, that's the way to go. But I'll I'll address that later. Um, Looking, though, at the collection or the manuscripts of Wedemu Maihi Terangi Kaheke, um, one of his stories, which is the legend of Hinemoa and Tutanakai, actually includes the word takatāpui, which means intimate companion of the same sex. And as much as the story uh, focuses on the heterosexual romance between a rather extraordinary female and um, the man to whom she was attracted, uh, Tutanakai, Tutanakai was in a really intense relationship with other men. And this is described in this manuscript. What is also described in considerable detail is the way that Henemoa, the um, valorous maiden who swam a huge lake in the middle of the night to get to the island where Tutanakai was living with um, his hua takatāpui, um, to attract his attention, she actually assumed the behavior and the voice and the challenging masculinity of a young man. And to get Hutanakai, the male of voice, into the mineral spring swimming about with her, she smashed calabashes. She threatened his partner, Tiki, the other man, and then she um, challenged Tutanakai. Now, you don't hear about that aspect of this extraordinary relationship in the published legends, in the two films that have been made about the story, um, in the postcards and the tableaus, and even current music that is being performed, and the the type of, um, God, um, glamour that has, heterosexist glamour that has been sprinkled across the story. And yet, um, it is within this manuscript, now in the Auckland Public Library, that you find, I think, the real depth and richness of um, Māori sexuality and Māori erotic identity and self-naming in um, the work of Wiremu Maihi Te Rangi Kāheke. Um, continuing though, 
I um I'd like to mention as well um that there is a considerable visual record. Um, I, as I said earlier, I'm an art historian. Um, in the early 80s, I did a postdoctoral um, fellowship at Pitt's Museum in Oxford, and from there went on to the BM. And part of my um, quest, I suppose, was looking for what I called anatomies of desire, the visual record, because I rationalized that if there was so much um, hot oil in the oral record, like in the chant, in the whakapapa, in the mōteatea, um, then surely there was also, because Māori are an incredibly um, creative, visually productive, um, people, we make houses are elaborate, they're hugely carved and ornamented, our canoes are great works of art, and even our most functional objects like containers, musical instruments and weapons are um, beautifully um, designed and um, decorated. And I thought, well, surely there are elements of um, same-sex activity out there in some of the images that were collected before the missionaries turned up and destroyed most of them. Um, I've got to say we have um, a really strong and tragic art history of emasculation and gouging and um, grotesque, um, I think, um, symbolic de-sexing in um, many of the collections of Māori work throughout the world, not just here in museums in Aotearoa, but wherever um, they were taken. So it's been, you know, it's been quite a hard um, project finding them all, but I have found some. Um, in the British Museum, in the Auckland Museum, and in uh, Dresden and Hamburg, there are some very beautiful, finely detailed examples of same-sex erotic activity. And most of this material dates from the 18th century. So it's out there. And it's given just as much um, emphasis and um, graphic detail as um, heterosexual coitus, um, which is, of course, the principal design element on a number of carved panels and um, particularly in musical instruments and also um, ceremonial containers. Um, I've always argued the evidence is there, we can find it. And um, in a way, that's my job. But Continuing, um, oh, this is just another lovely image, and I um, I lament the notion now that there is such doubt and discomfort in the world. I think caused by pornography, caused by the immediacy of um, visual, destructive, peculiar, twisted, um, misogynistic imagery um, pouring into our kids' bones. Um, undisciplined and unfiltered, accepted the stuff, and I'm conscious of the earlier speakers, um, uh, Joe Alistair, Jan Tenakoto, because I think um, it was pretty well, it absolutely was me. So I think that. When I consider the world in which I grew up, and I was born after the 
Second World War. So I uh, was raised in the 50s and 60s um, during a period of huge social upheaval, even in my community. And for those listening um, from overseas, um, my landscape is volcanic, it's thermal, it's steam, it's boiling mud, it um, buggers up internet connections and broadband. Um, and it always, always, always attracted overseas visitors so that tourism and um, the influence of overseas visitors to do visual, visual and oral performance, but also as well how we entertained and mixed with visitors so that um, at this point I um, mihi to a really important um, gender historian, Chris Brickle, when he observes that Rotorua, this town in which I live, was very much a focus and an ultimate destination for homosexual men. Um, I might also add for a lot of women. Anyway, continuing, um, I come into um, my next slide, and I'm watching the time. I think I've got a wee bit of time to um, answer questions. Um, here I have um, what I call issues for Cardo, and I think that within the Maori world, the most important and driving core value is whakapapa, is genealogy, is kinship, and the connections between the living and the dead. So that there has always been a requirement that humans reproduce. <laughs> and I know that's a pretty basic thing to say, but when the population of the people got down to below 30,000 and was as 27,000 in the 1890s, then um, you're looking at a really critical situation. Um, we also have a massive um, wealth of um, oral history um, about um, the importance of continuing one's lineage. But related to that as well, particularly um, in the world that I know, is that there is a sense of fluidity, not rigidity. And I think this is where medicalized intervention and the notion that one must be one or the other is so dangerous. That um, in that uh, in the Aotearoa, in that period before Christianity, before the colonial process invaded us before all of those things. And I think to a huge extent even now, um, it was okay to shift, to change, to explore, to transform, to try different things. And then if they didn't work, to reset and go back, to enjoy absolutely everything that your body that your emotional landscape, that your world had to offer you. And these continued well into the 20th century. And across the Pacific, there has always been multiple choices, multiple options in how one sees oneself and in how one engages erotically with another. And um, I... I come again as well to the notion of naming and how in finding those words like um, takatāpui, like whakatāne, like whakawahine, and in more recent times the invention of a new word, irafiti, which means crossing identities, um, that for me creates um, a whole bunch of questions as well. Because irafiti is a word that's often used by pre-trans activists, and it comes from iratane, which is the male essence, and ira wahine, which is the female essence, and then iratangata, 
which is what has recently been described as uh, by some Māori academics as personhood or being a person. And then we come to ira whiti, and whiti means to cross over, it means to shift. Um, unlike other native communities, we don't really have a sense of being too spirited. We believe we have many different spirits as Māori and we move within that world and different um, identities or fluidities will emerge at any given point. What's interesting though, and I just need to mention this, is that um, celebrity in Te Ao Māori and Te Ao Pacifica has um, become really tempting. And we know, apart from the appearance of Mecca as in the piano, within the political environment here, we've had some really incredibly interesting um, trans individuals. Um, the most prominent being, of course, Carmen, uh, Carmen Rupe, who went on to become a successful entrepreneur and entertainer in Sydney. And then um, in the true context, of course, the glorious and exceptional Georgina Bayer, whom I consider to be utterly singular. Um, on stream television and Māori television, as well as the program Takatāpui, we have um, the beauteous Ramon Ewake production of Queens of Pānguru. And again, this um, raises that whole notion, which I think Joe mentioned, about being AGP. And I think that um, the AGP identity is one that um, fits into whakawahine and whawhawhine. And it's one that I find um, particularly interesting because I think as well watch lesbian and um, how as a child growing up, I had aunts who were civil for six hours a day, they became women and had to wear skirts to work. And then the rest of their lives were spent in, um, in men's clothing. So it, it's, um, um, it's all just so incredibly fluid. And I don't think that in the community of which I am part, we can, um, we can really be restrictive and rigid because it just, it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't work at all. Anyway, coming on, or rather continuing, um, I think too that reclaiming our erotic and sexual identity with reference to our, um, our own histories is our priority and our right. After the massive shift to cities following World War II, of course, many, many tens of thousands of Māori living in the towns became disconnected from their cultural and um, linguistic environments. But in the last 50 years, we've seen the intense reclamation and reinvention of those worlds. And I think part of that resurgence has also been the reclaiming of our, our erotic and sexual identities. I'd like to finish by saying that this is a Māori problem. This is a Māori issue, and we will deal with it our way. There's no data yet on the levels of pharmaceutical and medical intervention, surgical or otherwise, in, um, in the Māori world. Um, working as I do, because I live here in the village in um, Rotorua, with um, my, my community, my tribe, um, 
we're actively involved with Te Whatu Order and certainly with the whole order communities. And it's, um, it's something that we're watching out for. But I'd like to emphasize again that um, it's our stuff. It's our issue. We will deal our way. And um, before I complete the, um, before I conclude and open to questions, I'd um, also like to mention, because I note there's no Pacifica um, contributor to the discussion, that possibly one really intriguing resource to consider is um, the exhibition by Yuki Kihara, which appeared at the Venice Biennale last year, and the um, associated videos and book on Paradise Camp, because I think it's for us to define the way we go forward, and it's for us as Indigenous, Pacifica, and Māori people to reclaim, to define our own identities. Um, I think um, I'll um, conclude my talk here and um, open it to discussion. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora ngā huia. Thank you so much. Um, we've had one question that's come through. Uh, do you have any insight on how the word Takitapui um, was gifted to the entire LGBTQIA++ alphabet soup community? I don't think it was gifted. I think it was commandeered. <laughs> um, and, and that's um, a kind of interest story too because um, I, I found it in my Krawa's manuscript. I'll say I am a descendant of Wedumu Mahi Te Rangi Kahiki. He's my grandfather five generations back. So when I speak of him, I'm speaking of my own blood. Um, the word comes up in um, the story of Henemoa and Tutanakai. And both Lee Smith, um, who was part of the Māori Language Commission staff and also um, a founding member of Gay Liberation Aotearoa New Zealand and um, Ngā Tamatoa, the Māori activist group, um, we both came across it pretty much in the same week. And I told uh, people about it in Auckland and in my communities, and he ran around Wellington telling people about it in his. And we both um, kind of agreed that we, um, we, we, we found it together. Um, even though I'm the descendant, he's not. Um, we never gave it to anyone. It's just there. It's like, who gave same-sex attracted women, the word lesbian. Um, I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question, but I certainly never made it a gift one, and I can't think of Lee doing the same. So I actually think it was just um, like so many other uh, phrases in contemporary language, something that was picked up and that it fitted. Um, however, it is primarily about same-sex attraction. It's not about rainbow communities and it's not about um, transsexual identity as I see it. And it's, you know, it's about um, same-sex attraction the word takatapui, whereas, for example, whakawahine or um, takatahane is very much about um, moving beyond, um, assuming that identity, um, making that decision, albeit 
for a few hours of your life or for your entire life. It's not Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Um, listening to you, I, I was reminded of the saying, the past is a foreign country. And uh, as someone who did undergraduate studies in history myself, um, I had to learn to inquire uh, gently and patiently and not bring my preconceptions from today and read them back into the past um, or to project the uh, frameworks and preconceptions of past peoples into the current moment. Um, you've given us quite a lot of insight on this, but would you like to say more about what you think the past can teach us as we think about uh, standards of care for uh, children and young people who are confused about their uh, gender and who they are in the world? Um, I think that the most important um, I don't want to say advice, would be if it were a, well, any child with a, you know, from whatever cultural background. I think that, like for me, it's about relationships, it's about loving, it's about compassion, it's about making that little person feel happy and content with who they are and how they are and if you can do that within your own home or um, within your own communities um, it's a start I think that you know I, I'm so um, I'm so distressed by the way that schools are using um, this right or this um, model of um, shaping and influencing um, young minds and bodies and souls. I think that every child has got the right to be loved for who and what they are and be happy with who and what they are and, and that begins in those primary relationships. It's about you know, it's about having someone in your life that loves you and says when you're a six-year-old or an 11-year-old or a 14-year-old and um, not really that happy with how you're looking because you've got the people on your phone, um, that you're okay. You know, that you're okay as you are. Um, and somehow that's kind of missing being interfered with or um, the you know in my immediate family um, we've got a couple of critical situations um, and I know and I'm doing what I can that um, the person wishing to transition had a horrific experience as a, a very vulnerable little person and um, I just I just think wait what you know you'll move through this shit you don't have to turn into the gender of the person what got me is that and this without identifying anyone what really got me this young soul and I said it to the person's parents wants to become bodied the person that assaulted that person mm. I'm, I'm, I'm talking gobbledygook but I'll just say that by assuming the um, outward um, gender display of the person who abused you will not make you stronger, will not make Thank you, you clearer yeah. and better. Yeah. Thank you, Ngahuia. That also gives us a great transition into our next speaker, 
Thank you okay. so much for joining us today uh, and very best wishes.